on this Tuesday night, the federal budget and what it means for you. A promise to target inflation relief. These are significant and necessary investments. And the billion dollar bet on Canada's green economy. Having government support is really critical. What that means for this country's energy sector. You give us a problem, we will find the solution. Community in mourning, the calls for more resources after another Canadian police officer is killed on the job. Plus, the uneasy calm in Israel. We're in a ceasefire rather than an internal domestic peace. The fired defense minister refuses to step down. How politics in Israel is in disarray. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The federal government has released its 2023 budget and dental care, inflation relief and incentives for investors in the green economy are top priorities. So is reining in some of the costs of running the government. The budget projects spending will reach nearly $491 billion in the coming fiscal year with the deficit on track to hit $40 billion. Our chief political correspondent David Aiken spent the day digesting all the budget documents. David, take us through the biggest points. Sure. Well, I think this is the seventh Liberal budget since the Trudeau government took over. It's probably the most modest. And I think what the Finance Minister, Christopher Freeland, is trying to do here is really balance three objectives. First of all, she wants to shore up the country's fiscal foundation in anticipation there may be slower economic growth ahead. Two, she wants to set the economy on a new green path to the future. And then third, and perhaps most importantly, I think she wants to help out the millions of Canadians who right now are having a hard time dealing with the rapidly rising cost of living. And that is what this budget invests in. The possibility for every single Canadian to share in the remarkable opportunities that Canada provides and in the new era of prosperity that we will build together. The budget centerpiece is a one-time cost of living rebate worth $467 for couples with children, $234 for single Canadians, and an extra $225 for seniors. The government is calling it a grocery rebate, but you can spend it on anything you want. It will be paid out to 11 million Canadians. When? That's TBD. Given the pressures that household budgets are under, I can imagine that any amount is going to be helpful. The government also promises to lower credit card transaction fees for businesses and prohibit what it calls hidden junk fees that consumers pay. Things like roaming charges or surcharges for concert tickets, even excess baggage fees. Freeland also announced an expansion of what is now called the Canadian Dental Care Plan. That's a plan that had covered dental bills for children in lower income households. Now, by the end of 2023, any uninsured person in a household earning less than $90,000 can get federal dental coverage. The government is also scaling back a planned tax hike on beer, wine and spirits. The alcohol excise tax will now jump 2% on April the 1st, rather than 6.5%. Overall, new spending commitments total $43 billion over the next five years. And most of that is a result of increased health transfers to the provinces. This is, I think, a bit of a pivot for, for this Liberal government. It's a relatively small budget. The government says its budget plan is sustainable. Our country has a proud tradition of fiscal responsibility. That is a tradition we are determined to uphold. Now, as for political reaction, the Conservatives say too much spending, they're not going to vote for it. The Bloc Québécois says not enough spending, they're not going to vote for it. But of course, Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh did a deal in 2022. They made some arrangements and uh, there's a lot in this budget the NDP will vote for, so I don't think there'll be much drama, Donna. This budget is going to pass the House of Commons. Okay, David Aiken, thank you. A major focus of the budget is the so-called green economy to build the clean technology sector in Canada and create jobs. The investment in green energy is also meant to respond to U.S. policies that are heavily subsidizing that sector. Turiya Isri is looking at what was in the budget to address that. Turiya. Donna, the second biggest item in the budget after health is boosting clean energy. The government is spending almost $20 billion over the next few years on green jobs and technology. The Liberals are trying to sell it as the most significant transformation since the Industrial Revolution. Our plan means good paying jobs, good careers for everyone everywhere, from our biggest cities 
to our smallest towns. The government is spending $18.5 billion over the next five years on things like clean tech manufacturing, clean hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. Much of the money will come in the form of tax credits, which could be a boost to companies like this Edmonton startup. It is really challenging, so having government support uh, is, is really critical. That support is meant to keep Canada competitive. The U.S. is spending massively on green jobs as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. We would have liked to see more, more talk about fossil fuels. Um, we know that the climate crisis is fundamentally an issue of fossil fuel production, fossil fuel consumption. We know that fossil fuels are also a really important part of the Canadian economy and we need to have a mature conversation about that. The federal government is also trying to polyev proof the carbon tax by signing business contracts to make sure the program lasts. Other green measures are aimed right at the pocketbook. Ottawa wants a universal charger to work on all devices, Apple or Android, to cut down on waste and costs. The Liberals are also bringing in a right to repair to make it cheaper and easier to fix home appliances, electronics and farming equipment. The Liberals are also pledging $2 billion over the next five years to improve service at Canada's struggling airports. But passengers will have to pay slightly more for airline tickets. Security charges are going up between $5 and $10 next year. Donna? Right, Turia Isri, thank you. And with me now from Ottawa is the Finance Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland. Ms. Freeland, thanks so much for taking time with us. Um, can we start with the big picture? A number of analysts and groups such as the Conference Board of Canada anticipate Canada will slip into a recession in the next 12 months. What's your view on that? Is it inevitable? Well, no one gave me a crystal ball when I became Finance Minister. But what I can tell you is what the average of the predictions of private sector economists who we surveyed and whose forecasts we used as the base case for the budget was. And what they're forecasting is a slowdown of the Canadian economy, what they would call a technical, a mild recession this year with 0.3% decline in the first quarter, 0.8 decline in the second quarter, 0.3 in the third quarter, and the good news, a comeback of 1.1% in the fourth quarter of this year. Is so far what we have seen is employment is remaining really, really strong. Uh, there are still job vacancies being advertised out there. And so even as the economy is slowing down, we're not seeing yet that kind of personal pain, which I think people associate with an economy that's slower. You're projecting a deficit about $10 billion higher than initially forecast. So the official opposition says there's far too much spending in this budget, that they call it an attack on hardworking people in this country. What's your rebuttal to that? You know, I have two rebuttals, Donna. The first thing I would say is, so what would you cut? Would you cut the grocery rebate checks to the most vulnerable Canadians? I sure wouldn't, because I think those 11 million Canadian households really need a little extra support. Would you cut the investment that we announced in February in Canada's healthcare system or the expansion of the dental care system? I sure wouldn't do that. I think Canadians rightly rely on our universal public health care system, and Canadians know we needed some more money to make it work. And then the final thing I'd ask is, would you cut our investments in the clean economy? This is a fiscally responsible budget. Yes, we have made the necessary essential investments we need to make in Canadians, but we have done that within a fiscally responsible framework. The GST rebate or the grocery rebate as you're calling it, when are Canadians going to get it? Okay, I cannot say precisely because delivering this stuff takes time, um, but you know, within the next within the next couple of months. How's that? All right. Finance Minister and Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland, thanks. The opposition leader, uh, Pierre Polyev, said he doesn't support the spending in this budget. He says conservatives will be voting against the plan to add what he calls billions of new inflationary debt and tax hikes on things like heat, gas and groceries. Today's 
budget by the costly coalition of the NDP and Liberals is a full frontal attack on the paychecks of hardworking Canadians. It equals $4,200 per family in new government spending. That's more inflation, more taxes, and more costs for everyday people. There's no common sense. Reaching Ottawa's net zero emissions target is a focus of the budget. There are billions in tax credits available to companies that are in the clean technology sector. Canada's competing with the U.S., which has unveiled a $370 billion program of tax credits and subsidies for electric vehicles, batteries and renewable energy projects, if they are American-made. The government doesn't want Canadians to be left behind. Heather Urex west reports. In Red Deer, Alberta, on a street called Energy Way, you won't find any multinational oil giants raking in record-setting cash. I've been involved in the oil and gas industry and construction for 23 years now. Instead, you'll find plenty of energy industry entrepreneurs, small business owners like James Pierce, who are used to booms, busts, and an ever-present need to change. That's going on a rig. His two-year-old company sells hydrogen on-demand units for drilling rigs and heavy trucks. We inject hydrogen in through your turbo uh, and it uh, mixes and blends with your diesel and gives you fuel savings right off the bat and also reduces your emissions. The small business is Pierce's own idea of a just transition, finding a way to work within the energy sector to forge a cleaner path. If you look at the energy services sector, we always say we're the innovators and solution finders. So you give us a problem, we will find the solution. Though this industry advocate says the sector could use some help along the way, pointing to the clean energy incentives in the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. What they have done is provided a roadmap and Canada just needs to follow suit and, and provide the same opportunities to our members here. The words just transition or sustainable jobs plan are politically divisive in this province. The current premier is definitely not a fan. But what about Alberta's workers themselves? We ran a poll in 2021, and what we saw is the overwhelming majority of workers that are currently working in the oil and gas and coal sector are very interested in a career in the net zero uh, industries. Iron and Earth, a group of former oil sands workers turned advocates for the energy transition, say what workers need is more support whether it's from Ottawa or whoever forms Alberta's next government in a few weeks' time. Heather Urex west Global News, Red Deer, Alberta. Coming up, a Quebec police officer killed on the job. A Quebec provincial police officer and a suspect died last night after an attempted arrest. It happened in the town of Louisville. It's about an hour east of Montreal. Police say they were responding to a dispute about a man uttering threats at an apartment complex. Sergeant Maureen Bro was stabbed to death. She is the eighth police officer to die on the job in this country in the past six months. Phil Carpenter reports. An electronic sign just outside Louisville City Hall bears the grim news of a community in mourning. Sergeant Maureen Bro, a 20-plus year veteran of the Quebec Provincial Police, lost her life following an incident Monday night at an apartment on Saint Laurent Avenue in Louisville. C'est une tragédie. C'est une tragédie pour la communauté policière. Law enforcement representatives say it's a tragedy for the entire police community. Authorities say at around 8:30 Monday night, Bro and another officer responded to a call about a disturbance at a private home. According to the BEI, the provincial body responsible for investigating police intervention that result in the fatality, when the pair of officers tried to arrest a 35-year-old male suspect, Sergeant Bro was stabbed. She fell from a balcony and was later declared dead in hospital. The BEI says the suspect was fatally shot by another police officer who was called as backup. The other officer who was with Bro was also injured. The town's mayor says the incident is a tragedy and believes the suspect could have had a mental health crisis. He says we're asking police officers to be social workers and psychologists and that's not their job and said there should be more psychosocial support to avoid incidents like this. The head of the union representing the provincial police agrees that policing has become more complex, especially in interventions involving people in mental distress. Faire approach strategic. 
He says these days officers have to face a wide range of risks and they must be careful. He too is asking for more resources. The investigation is ongoing. Phil Carpenter, Global News, Louisville. Police in Nashville, Tennessee have released body camera footage from two officers who police say fatally shot the suspect who killed six people at a private Christian elementary school. They also say the attack was pre-planned. The body cam footage is dramatic. We're not showing all of it, but it could be disturbing to some. Door, door, with me, with me. Four minutes after they arrived at the school, police say they located and shot the 28-year-old suspect. Audrey Elizabeth Hale, they say, is a former student who was under doctor's care for what police call an emotional disorder. The city's police chief says the suspect bought at least seven firearms legally from five different stores across Nashville, including two assault rifles and a pistol used to carry out the mass shooting. Police are working on a motive. They found a detailed map of the school showing entry points and a manifesto that indicates the killer may have been planning to attack other locations. In Mexico, at least 39 people are dead at an immigration detention center just south of El Paso, Texas. The Mexican president says people held at the center fearing deportation set mattresses on fire. It's believed 68 men were inside when the blaze broke out. Crews rushed to the scene to try to help. The victims reported to be from Central and South America. It is one of Mexico's deadliest fires at an immigration lockup. Political uncertainty ahead. Will a delay on controversial legal reforms calm unrest in Israel? Israel's political future hangs in the balance now that the prime minister has agreed to delay his judicial reforms. They are deeply unpopular, even with senior people in Benjamin Netanyahu's own government. He fired the defense minister, but that minister is refusing to leave. Crystal Gamansing reports from Tel Aviv on the political disarray in Israel. A wave of democracy chants, drumming and blaring horns. This anti-reform demonstrator says the prime minister pausing his judicial reforms is an act of manipulation, something to buy him time in hopes that the people will settle down. Experts say what's unfolding in Israel as a result of Benjamin Netanyahu looking to give the government more control over the courts is remarkable. Prime Minister Netanyahu never dealt with such a pushback from Israeli public, Israeli civil society. We're in a ceasefire rather than an internal domestic peace between the different parts of Israeli society. Monday saw some of the biggest demonstrations, protesters and police fighting in the streets. It followed Netanyahu firing his defense minister after he criticized the reforms, saying they risked national security. Turns out that minister is still at work, having not been directly notified about his termination. I think the whole country can take a deep breath after three months of being at the edge of the cliff. I think Bibi made the right move stopping the progress of the reforms and listening to the voice of the protesters. While negotiations on creating more palatable reforms are underway, the far-right religious party of Itamar ben Gavir has stated publicly the reforms will pass. It's his party that keeps Netanyahu in office with a coalition government. The courts may need more checks and balances, but what's been proposed is not acceptable to many. And those Israelis plan to make sure the government doesn't forget it. Donna? All right, Crystal Gamansing in Tel Aviv. Thanks. Budget breakdown next. The biggest takeaways from the federal government's spending plan. Let's go back to Ottawa and talk about the federal budget. Mercedes Stevenson, our Ottawa bureau chief, is with me. Mercedes, economists, analysts anticipate Canada will head into recession in the next 12 months. Will that be the test of this budget, whether the government can keep the country on an even keel? 
Well, Donna, it's the challenge politically because, of course, the government is held accountable for how they fare in any coming difficult economic waters. And there's realistically only so much that the federal government can control for. When you look at what's happening with U.S. banks or concerns about the global economy and inflation, those are things that Christia Freeland can't stop. But if things go south, you know that she will be blamed for it. So what you see in this document, and, and we held it up in our federal budget special, but I'll hold it up for our viewers again, it is really thin for a Liberal government uh, budget. In fact, it's thin for a Harper government budget. So this is not the typical big spending, and that's a recognition that they are concerned about the effect that kind of spending could have on inflation and possible uh, currency devaluation as well. But at the same time, they're trying to put some of these big programs in the window that they've promised. And of course, you see a lot of retail politics in this budget. Things that they hope will attract people's attention, whether it's the baggage fees or the universal charger for your phone. Uh, and those are things that they are hoping will resonate. They're vulnerability on it remains the tax issue. That's something that Pierre Polyev was attacking today, and it's something that people get more riled about as they feel that squeeze coming in. Uh, so how this all fares, to some degree, will be at the government's feet, but regardless of, of what these sort of uh, economic trade winds do, they will be the ones who are left holding the bag. And quickly, Mercedes, one place where the government was vulnerable was on their reliance, heavy reliance, on private consultants. How are they changing that? Well, they've recognized that that was a political liability for them, particularly when they weren't looking to cut programs. And this is a government that has significantly, significantly grown the bureaucracy. Uh, so they are vowing to spend less on those consultants. They are trying to send the signal that they are looking for places where they can cut without actually digging into federal programs. It's something they were politically concerned about, and we see that reflected here. Okay, Mercedes Stevenson in the foyer of the House of Commons. Thanks. And that is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is the Devils Oven Ice Caves in Minto, New Brunswick. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye bye.